Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing incredibly well. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, the rain began to vigorously pelt down the roof, splashing against the windows of our high-rise family apartment where I lived with my mother and my brother Curtis, in the South East side of Boston, which is South Boston, not quite the same as South East Boston. I know it's confusing. Our home is close to the seaport in the coastal downtown region, infiltrated by a plethora of young people. It's a young, tech-savvy city with lots of students, colleges and universities. The city has a dense, walkable downtown with lots of crooked one-way roads. It's situated close to bountiful bars, avant-garde restaurants, eclectic and sometimes whimsically twee coffee shops. There's a beach with a running path that people like to use for running or walking. People think everyone in Boston is a die-hard liberal, which is not 100% true. I am certainly not. I'd hate to be typecast because I live here. Many people these days are swinging more Republican, so things are changing in the political compass of this place, rather like a dripping tap. But most people prefer to keep their political allegiances, whatever they may be, extremely private, which is fair enough. Although you do get those types who are offended if you're not rooting for the same side, as they are, and will be quick to tell you why your opinions are misguided. Let's just say folks here can be tough, and very opinionated sometimes. But when you crack the outer shell, they can be pretty cool underneath it all. But don't expect them to greet you down the sidewalk, as that ain't likely to happen. It's not that their inclination is to be unfriendly, but more like a polite, rather evasive reserve that somewhat subdues their ebullience. A quarter of the population here boasts Irish ancestry, so on St. Patrick's Day you'll see people walking around, sporting green garlands and hats, very proud to boast in an Irish lineage. Life has never been easy growing up in a family with a mother who had a bipolar disorder that had never been fully diagnosed. Somehow avoiding psychologists like the plague was her way of living in denial, her artful technique of pretending there were no hiccups or stumbling blocks in her life. If you didn't admit there was a problem, then there wasn't one, so to speak. My mother could be one minute in the most enervated mood, that was so positive, so exuberant. Then her mood would crash like a thunderous ocean wave thrashing against the rocks. She could be heard throwing pots and pans around the kitchen as she screamed out in frustration. When she became irate like this, it was a scary experience indeed as heaven help you if you got caught up in the spiralling crossfire of her wrath. Not that she ever raised her fists to us, but on two occasions me and my brother were clobbered by a dirty trainer, with the smell more offensive than the clobbering itself. But I hasten to say that was not a pleasant experience that we ever cared to repeat. My dad had walked out on us when I was about seven years old. I think he couldn't take my mother's emotional mood swings a moment longer. He'd had enough, so he filed for divorce. How could I blame him for that? As if I was wearing his shoes, I would have done exactly the same thing. I'd always known that as soon as I was old enough, I would leave my mother's home so fast, following in the footsteps of those before me, eager to disappear from her indomitable grasp. I don't want you to get the impression I don't love my mother. I do. But living with someone with precarious, fluctuating moods can rarely wear away at you. For me personally, I found my mother hard work. Luckily, the apartment where we lived was our saving grace, and was actually in my father's name, so could not be sold or mortgaged without his say-so. Even though he was out of our lives, he kept his eye on everything through a friend of his, whom regularly visited us, and reported back to my dad. To be fair to my father, he sent us birthday cards and Christmas presents every year, but we had no recollection of him at all. In the beginning, he left my mother money in her account, and every month he did a direct transfer into her account to provide for childcare costs, but we never saw much of it, as it invariably was spent on alcohol and cigarettes. 
It seemed to us as if my dad disappeared into the sunset, never to be heard from or seen again, apart from a stray present or card here and there. I knew he was out there somewhere, probably with a wife and family of his own, which meant I might have some stepbrothers or sisters out there, which was something I occasionally thought about, but to date have never been able to uncover, but here is still hoping. My mother's own parents were estranged from her, and every job she attained lasted barely two minutes, before she was given her marching orders by well-meaning bosses, who were crumbling under the arduous strain of dealing with such a vacillating, unstable character. Something had to give under the weight of that pressure, and it was always my mother's job that ended up being folded up like an old camping chair and discarded. Even though my mother had a plethora of boyfriends over the years, she was not an unattractive woman, but when her suitors were exposed to the dark side of her personality, they would scurry away like frightened rabbits on the prairie, hurrying to their burrows, but I never blamed them for that. I mean, how could I? I do remember on one occasion having a heart-to-heart -heart with my mother about her many issues when she was in a more sober, reflective state of mind, and open to reason, where she was bold enough to examine her life through a microscope, and was not taking such easy offence to a critical analysis, which was unusual for her. She was prone to being highly sensitive, easily offended, although she wasn't afraid to give it as good as she got when the need arose and could become indignantly hot-headed at times. Why does everybody leave me? You kids have only stayed with me because I'm your mother. You've got nowhere else to go. Look at me. I'm such a mess. I can't keep a job, nor a man. I have no friends. Even they desert me. The only people that speak to me these days are the bartenders at the bar, across the road. They have to be civil to me, don't they? Because I'm paying them good money. I overheard one saying to his friend, That woman is a liability, as loopy as a fruitcake. She drives me nuts. It really hurt. Mum, you have a psychological condition, I told her lovingly, giving her a warm, encouraging hug. My friend Beryl believes you have bipolar disorder, just like her mother does. But it's easily sorted out. It's nothing to feel ashamed about. Like any condition, physical or mental, it just needs to be addressed. You need to visit a psychologist, get evaluated and medicated, your mood stabilised. That way you will function better in society. Maybe keep a job, make some new friends. My friend Beryl's mother had her job for over eight years. She's been married for ten, still is married to the same man. Things would never have worked out for her so well without medication. There's nothing wrong, Mum, in admitting you need help. I can't possibly go to a psychologist, Howie, my mother had said, looking appalled. There's nothing wrong with me. Do you get that? I'm just a little moody, that's all. It's possibly my hormones flying all over the place. Maybe they're out of alignment. Woman's hormones can screw with you, but you wouldn't know about that, would you? Then see a doctor, I begged. But would she listen? Absolutely not. Denial was her very best friend, who had held her hand every day of her life, actively discouraging her from doing anything that might bring her condition into the bold light of day, to admit that she actually had a problem. The trouble was that me and my brother Curtis had to bear the brunt of her mood swings. That was never easy. When my mother's mood became foul, she would self-medicate, always turning to alcohol, to lift her out of the pit of desolation, so she could avoid hitting rock bottom, like a stone sinking to the bottom of a lake. She could get that low, hanging around someone draped in the dark clouds of their hopelessness, which she wore like an overcoat that she refused to remove, was hard going. She had a love-hate relationship with the dark side of herself, whose company, although not pleasant, she still chose to entertain. Suffice to say she would drag her oppressed state of mind like the dirty laundry in a basket across the road from our apartment and indulge herself at the local bar, whiling away the long lonely hours in a desolate looking place, getting inebriated and flirting tirelessly with anyone on two legs that was buying drinks. Let's just say a free drink from a perfect stranger that she could easily charm with a flutter of her eyelashes was always welcome and procured no dent in her pocket. After an afternoon spent at the bar, 
She would return home, looking like a sorry, wretched sight. She would stumble back home, bladdered. Her legs would wobble unsteadily beneath her, like a newborn foal that was actually learning to walk. She would pass out on the couch, collapse, and fall into a deep sleep, her snores filtering through the house in strangled snorts. I knew then you cannot change the sound of an echo, and that my mother was resolutely determined to stay stuck in her ways. Although beneath the veneer, I knew she longed to change, but she lacked the courage to do it. She lacked the courage to take that quintessential fork in the road of her life, as toiling down the same laborious path seemed infinitely more preferable. If there was anything positive about my mother's bipolar disorder, it had harnessed within me an extreme desire to be independent. So from the early age of 14, I had found various jobs which enabled me to contribute significantly towards family groceries, which would never have been bought if my mother had got her hands on my money. But I guarded it with my life, hiding it secretly under loose wooden panels under my bed. She liked to spend her money on cigarettes and alcohol. The money my father sent her in order to care for us was spent to accommodate her addictions. My mother managed her alcohol better than most, I will admit, and it did seem to diffuse her anger somewhat. So for that I was grateful. Yet I wished with all my heart she would have had the courage and conviction to actually seek help. It would be lovely to be given some breathing space from the roller coaster of our lives, to live around normality for a change. Indeed, I didn't know what a normal life really was. But as one of my friends so eloquently put it, What's normal? We all have our issues. Nobody's life is seamless. I had a sneaking suspicion. He was absolutely right about that. My brother was a simple young man. He was on the autism spectrum, which meant he was set in his ways, woefully abhorred any changes in the routines of life, and was rigidly structured in everything he did. A quiet soul, an unassuming character, who didn't like to interact with strangers much. Although he was my older brother, I had to take care of him. He was not capable of looking after himself, for an extended period of time, that is. But a few hours left to his own devices... He was perfectly fine, and I loved him with my whole heart. As the rain pelted down, it stilled my troubled mind. My brother was sitting in front of the television set, with the face of an animated cherub, watching the Lord of the Rings for the thousandth time over, with the enthused excitement of seeing it for the very first time. My brother was a handsome boy, with childlike wispy ringlets of blonde spiralling hair that bounced around his square-shaped masculine face in a Nordic swirl. His piercing blue eyes were fringed by long dark lashes. His body was naturally muscled, without engaging in tireless workouts in the gym, for my brother did not interest himself in such trivialities. Without the autism, I imagine the woman would be champing at the bit to date him, for he could easily have graced the covers of a glamour magazine, without a problem. But the annoying thing was that my brother couldn't have given a toss if he'd had the face of a robber's dog or not as his looks were as meaningless to him as whether he had milk on his Cheerios at breakfast. He liked Cheerios both ways, with milk and without, which meant his looks were literally wasted on him. On several occasions he'd been scouted by model agencies. Let's just say I wasn't so lucky in the looks department. My brother was blessed with good looks and me mediocre brains. I wasn't bad looking, but the pendulum swung in the average direction as far as my looks were concerned, as did my grades, sports ability, and artistic prowess. I had blonde straw-like hair that lacked my brother's buoyancy, was cut in a spunky hairstyle to make me look a little bit more arresting, but my wispy hair needed to be dipped in a plethora of hair gel to maintain those hedgehog-like spikes. My facial features were unremarkable and forgettable, with eyes the colour of insipid coffee, my body was a little on the skinny side, having been atrociously defeated by multiple beleaguered attempts in the gym, when I surrendered myself to the horrifying realisation that I just wasn't going to beef up significantly to make all this arduous exercise worth my while. So for me, average dappled my life. I was reasonably accepting about this. In truth, I would hate to be the kind of person that turned heads wherever I went. It was so much better to melt into the background, to remain invisible. As the rain bucketed down in cats and dogs, 
and the trees in the neighbourhood twinkled with glittering opaque droplets of rain. I found myself lost in my own thoughts. My mother was sitting in a dingy bar across the street, getting bladded as usual. While I was pondering what I was going to do about my English project for college, I was expected to write an old person's autobiography about their life and times of someone significantly older than myself. We were informed by our teacher that we would be surprised about the treasured stories that were contained within every older person. It's up to you to squirrel those stories out of these people. I want stories that are exciting, so don't you dare disappoint me, she'd informed us. My grandparents on both sides of the family were not involved in our lives, so who could I ask to help me with this project? It suddenly dawned on me that I could go to a retirement home and see if anyone there would be willing to talk to me. With that inspirational thought sizzling away in my mind like a firework sparkler, I hastily grabbed my waterproof windbreaker, zipping myself beneath its protective folds, covering my head with the hoodie. Where are you going? asked my brother, with an expressionless face, as if he wasn't interested either way what my answer actually would be. I won't be gone long, I said, knowing I didn't want to have to explain my project to my brother. It was easier to fob him off with brief answers, rather than to go into in-depth explanations about my English project. I knew it was raining, and potentially I could get soaked, but this idea pestered me. I was determined to strike while the iron was hot. Could I potentially find an older person willing to talk to me about their life of yesteryear? I knew there was a retirement place not too far away from us. I'd noticed it before, so I got into my mother's twenty-year-old rusted Honda Accord, which I'd pretty much taken over, as my mother normally was too drunk to drive and couldn't risk acquiring a DUI, so I did all the grocery shopping for her, everything for the family, and that worked out remarkably well for us. I dropped the car into gear quickly, trundling down the clean roads of Boston, merging with the traffic and then veering onto the I-35. Finally I hit cross town. I was admiring the wet sheen of the road. From the rain, I could see either side of the road, under the vigorous motion of my windscreen wipers that were brushing the water aside with brisk rhythmic motions. I observed the attractive paved sidewalks planted up with long lines of trees, typically surrounded by the bricked high-rise buildings that plundered the skyline, wearing the influences of the Puritan settlers who brought with them the indelible hallmarks of English architecture here that morphed into Georgian and colonial styles further down the line. Boston wears its rich history with a hoity-toity pomp and ceremony, a pride it doesn't want to shake off, but is only too glad to celebrate with a vain glorious haughtiness that makes many believe our city is rather stuck up and conceited. It would seem the streets are littered with the stereotype pompous smug looking buildings and structures everywhere you go that appear to bask and sunbathe in the indulgence of their own self-importance. One of them being what I perceived was the retirement home that squatted proudly on its foundations as like so many of the prominent high-rise buildings here. The outside of the building is supported by thick ornate sculptural columns, so typically seen in Greek architecture. I'm ever thankful to find a parking spot on the opposite side of the street, as I believe I've spotted this retirement home. I'm sure that's it, which I understand is devoted to military retirees, whom I figured could have some scintillating stories to tell. I walk over to the glass doors of the building that open up like the doors of a bank. I enter the marble lobby, which meanders curvaceously into a prestigious reception area, which is similar to what you might expect to see in any office building, but grander and more lavish, leaving me to conclude that people staying here have got pockets that run deep. The floors of the reception area are aligned with expensive, ornate, heavily designed carpets, decorated in fabulously rich designs, like what you would expect to see in the Bellagio in Las Vegas and there is a swanky modern version of a chandelier shimmering from the high ornate ceiling. A young woman is sitting behind a very swanky avant-garde reception desk that looks like an ornate piece of modern art. It curls and sweeps into a pleasing symmetry. The white walls are adorned with illustrious pictures of elderly people, all in military uniforms, boasting medals and ribbons. There's even a framed letter from Dwight Eisenhower congratulating someone for their service to the military and of course the war effort.
The writing is faded. The edges of the letter curled up and rather warped. The ink so faded. I can barely read what it says, but I catch one line which reads, It's men like your son who fight for our great country that make me proud to call myself American. The receptionist is twiddling her long sweeping curls of dark hair, wearing a rather bemused expression upon her face. She rather reminds me of a dark-haired version of Marilyn Monroe. I make my approach towards her desk. She raises a perfectly manicured eyebrow at me, without saying a word. I can see their essential oil diffusers, burning the sweet fragrance of lemongrass all over the place, to clandestinely cover the other less agreeable smells that lurk beneath the fragrant infusions, like a whiff of bleach that didn't fail to grab my attention the moment I entered the building. There's an old man circling the area in a wheelchair, with a fixed, demented grin on his face. But it was like he was in another world, miles away from the reception area. I didn't exist in his current reality, any more than he existed in mine. He looked through me like a translucent pane of glass, as if I was not there, spun around in his wheelchair, with the behaviour more akin to a child than an eighty-year-old man. I got a sense he was spinning around in the vortexes of his mind, accessing galaxies that do not exist in our world. But his childlike demeanour seemed so alien in a body that was withered from age, with skin firmly clinging to his tight bones, and a muscle definition that is clearly expired. I don't know why, but the way the receptionist has looked at me has almost certainly ruffled my feathers. Fleeting doubts surge into my mind as to whether my plan to come here was such a good idea after all. Maybe it would be better to give chase, to get the hell out of this place. The receptionist is looking at me cynically. She pipes. How may I help you, young man? Her eyes hover over me like a questioning voucher, trying to make sense of what I'm doing here. They move up my body in a vertical sweep, from the shoes of my feet to my eyes. Her facial expression remains fixed, so I can't exactly tell whether I meet with her approval or not, for she gives nothing away. I'd like to see the manager of this place, if I may. I need to talk to him. She raises her brow cynically again. That's a bit presumptuous of you, is it not? For your information, Mr. Granger is a very busy man. What makes you feel you can intrude upon his schedule? From what I can see, you're not exactly a visitor here, nor a salesperson, nor do you work here. So why would you want to see him? If you're looking for a job here, I can give you an application form to fill in. But Mr. Granger doesn't see anyone willy-nilly. It is by appointment only, I'm afraid. Unless, of course, the situation is extremely urgent. I'm sorry to say, but from what I can see, there's no reason why I should call him on your behalf. Unless you can persuade me otherwise. And pardon me for saying this, but you haven't convinced me that you are worthy of his attention or time. I'm from Boston College, majoring in communications, media studies, broadcasting and public relations, I explain. I'm doing an English project, as far as I'm concerned. I really do need to see Mr. Granger. I'm doing a biography of someone old. I need to write about their lives, about their struggles and triumphs, stuff like that. Everything that defines who they have become today. Well, I can't promise you Mr. Granger will see you, she says. But I guess it's worth a try. I saw him bobbing around the dining hall at lunchtime, so I guess he may not be as busy as usual. But we shall see if I can get him for you. I've always had a soft spot for an aspiring writer. I wouldn't exactly call myself that. But thank you, ma'am. I'm most obliged. Don't thank me yet, says the young lady. My name is Louise, by the way, she says, lifting up the receiver. Yes, Mr. Granger. I've got a visitor in reception here. Claims he'd like a quick word with you. No, no, don't worry about that. He doesn't appear to be selling anything. She pops the phone back on the receiver, smiling up brightly at me. Mr. Granger will be here in two ticks. What seems like a moment later, a man emerges through the doorway, sporting a neat crop of salt and pepper coloured hair, a symmetrical face, ocean blue eyes. He's thin and lanky, enviably over six foot tall, and he wears his height well. He's dressed in a smart blue blazer, adorned with gold buttons, 
a crisp white shirt, a gold-spotted cravat, a mustard-coloured waistcoat, navy blue chinos, and a pair of smart coffee brown crocodile skin loafers. He flashes me a bright smile and reaches out to shake my hand warmly. His grip is firm and very congenial. So what do I owe this pleasure, young man? How may I be of service to you? My name is Howard Turner, although my friends call me Howie for short. Uh, um, I was wondering if I could do a biography on one of your elderly residents here for my English assignment. I just need to speak to someone here who may be able to share about some poignant memories in their lives. Mr. Errol Granger looks nonplussed. He furrows his brows awkwardly, glances over at me with an odd expression upon his face, while he wrings his hands, almost as if washing them under the tap. I guess it's his way of sifting through his thoughts, discerning the wood from the tree, so to speak. Why did you come here, young man? I mean, do you have any elderly grandparents that couldn't help you with this project of yours? I do, but I don't, I say grudgingly. I don't even know where they live these days. Last time I heard they were living in Bear Canyon, in Albuquerque, about 33 hours' drive from here. Well, they haven't been in touch with us for years. It would be awkward getting in touch with them now, after all this time, I think. I don't even know if they still stay in the earth, and even if they do, I think contacting them could get awfully prickly. I had found dealing with family was as complicated as walking through a thistle patch, as the path never ran smoothly when it came to my mother's side of the family, especially possibly as most of them seemed to have inherited her wavering, fickle moods. I continue, I'm not sure I'd even want to speak to them either if I am being perfectly frank with you. They've shown absolutely no interest in me. Why should I not extend them the very same courtesy that they've shown me? I say sarcastically. Oh dear, I sense I've hit a bit of a raw nerve there, says Mr. Granger, the contours of his face softening compassionately. I quite understand why you feel this way. If the boot were on the other foot and my grandparents had shown me such disregard... Well, I probably wouldn't like to know them either, let alone interview them about their lives, of which I clearly, as their grandson, played no influential part. As the good Lord says in his precious word, we reap what we sow. Let me just say, young man, that the residents here are possibly not quite the right candidates for you to interview. I mean, most of our elderly patients all come from military backgrounds. Some of them are war heroes, who can't take care of themselves any more. The vast majority of the folk here are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia, or other neurological conditions. If they can't even recognise their own faces, or remember their children's names, I'm quite sure the details of their lives have been extinguished a long time ago, which is a dreadful pity, as I think some of our residents may have riveting stories to tell that would be well worth hearing. But neurological illnesses spare no mercy on their victims. My heart leaps over the edge of disappointment and regret. It was just my luck to choose an elderly nursing home where the residents couldn't even remember their own names. But surely, surely there must be someone I could talk to. Someone whose mind is not stewing in jello. Well, let me think about that. Mr. Granger thinks for a moment on his feet. I could let you talk to Mr. Nicholas Ridgway, he says reflectively, but I can't promise you he will be willing to talk to you. The man is in his fifties and is the youngest man here, but because of his military affiliation, so to speak, we took him in. Nicholas, I believe, was involved in that military expedition. I think it was in 2001 or 2002, when the United States invaded Afghanistan with a clear objective to defeat Al-Qaeda. Regretfully, he's now dying from pancreatic cancer, but he does have his good days. You stay here for a moment, he says. I'll see what I can do for you. I can't promise anything. Keep your fingers crossed. Moments later, Mr. Granger re-emerges in the reception area with a huge grin on his face that is so wide I tremble in my shoes with excitement. I can tell by his thrilled expression 
that the news is very good. I'm very pleased to inform you, young man, that Nicholas Ridgway will gladly see you. He's had a very good day today. He has more bad ones than good ones, so it's possibly a good idea you take some notes down for yourself with him right now. I'm led into Mr. Ridgway's bedroom. I'm surprised how lovely the room is, as it doesn't look like your stereotype, mediocre pedestrian, run-of-the-mill hospital room. It is more like a luxurious suite in a grandiose, rather upmarket hotel, with fabulous upholstered furnishings, long glamorous curtains that swish above the lavish carpeting, large windows that overlook arresting views on the backyard, that is sprinkled with oak trees, beds of roses, viridescent manicured turf. The only thing that gives the game away is that this patient's room has a hospital bed, along with an oxygen mask and a drip the accessories clearly needed for a patient. The nurse has propped up Mr. Ridgway's head against the pillows. He is sitting up straight in bed, his mellow hazel eyes, buried in the back of his sunken sockets, appear to be twinkling. He's wearing a pair of pale blue and white pinstripe pyjamas. His cheeks are dented, rather like hollowed puddles, while a leathery jaundiced skin clings tightly to his face. His mouth is puckered and dry, he manages a smile of ancient-looking teeth that are as ravaged as his withering, frail body. I can see the cancer is not kind to your physical appearance. It pugnaciously hijacks your youth with a ravenous greed and eats up your energy reserves. This man doesn't only look like a mummified corpse, but he's the thinnest person I've ever encountered. His arms are like withering twigs. I'd say he looks closer to ninety than fifty. And for a moment, my ebullient enthusiasm nose dives like a plane that has lost its wing and comes hurtling to the ground. I mean, how can I possibly interview a man who looks like he's hanging onto the precipice of his life by a fine silvery thread that could potentially snap at any given moment? Even my questions could literally be too much for him. Hello, young man, says the voice that emerges from his throat that sounds more like a raspy croak. My eyes dart towards a bedside table. I see a gilded frame photograph of a relatively young, handsome man, wearing military uniform, smiling brightly into the camera. Is that you? I ask, looking stunned, unable to hide the obvious shock written all over my face. Yes, don't look so surprised. That was me in 2002, when I went to Afghanistan. Wasn't too bad looking back then, I have to say, he chuckles. But cancer has a way of ruining your robust health, shall we say. So you were a soldier in Afghanistan. Did you enjoy being in the military? I suppose that's a lame question to ask you. But I don't get how anyone could possibly enjoy fighting in a war. I'm no wimp, but I will tell you this. I would hate that. The best time of my life, son was had in the military. The friendships I made back then were like gold dust. The men on my platoon were more like brothers to me than mere acquaintances. If there's one thing I'm proud of, it's fighting for my country and for the freedom of people around the globe. Sometimes, son, we have to fight for what we believe in with all our might. All my life I've been fighting battles, but I'm fighting the hardest battle of all with this goddamned pancreatic cancer. And this is a battle, I regret to say, that despite a positive outlook, I will surely not win. Worse than Afghanistan, I ask. The cancer, I mean. Of course, you bet, he says. Cancer is no joke. So why exactly are you here, son? Why do you want a biography of me? I'm not exactly the most interesting character on this planet. You could do a lot better than me. I'm sure others have much more riveting stories than I do. Well, a biography is a bit extreme, I say. I really like stories about incidents or experiences in your life that you believe may have defined you. Our teacher is keen for us to make the stories exciting. She says that stories are the joy of our lives, but they need to be told well, and some excitement added to the mix would be much appreciated. Sounds like your English teacher has got rather big expectations. 
I hope not to disappoint you. But you want interesting, young man. I'll give you interesting. I can even add something incredulous and outlandish to the equation as well. Now you're talking, I say. Nicholas Ridgway's story in his own words. Well, I stepped down on foreign soil in Afghanistan for the first time in my life, in March of 2002, in a firefight against al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters. It was spring back then in Afghanistan, which can be rather rainy during the day, cold at night. And when I say cold, believe me, those temperatures can almost certainly drop down very, very low. And when you're out there in the wilderness, getting cold is tough going, believe me. The landscape is also unforgiving. Landlocked, shall we say. Tall, forbidding mountains, dry deserts with treacherous mountain peaks, covered in glistening white snow, almost the entire year round. The Afghans themselves were living in the fertile valleys between the mountains, growing crops, tending to their animals. One night, as everybody is fast asleep, me and my best friend Rupert are on night duty. Let's just say we slept whenever we could, but we were trained to be up like a rocket if enemy fire was serendipitously approaching us. I remember there was an icy cold wind blowing. The night was tenebrously dark, very austere, sombre, with a faint scattering of silvery stars and a moon that kept creeping behind the hovering mist. I was on night patrol with Rufus, watching the night very carefully, very assiduously with night vision goggles that are quick to discern anything unusual in the environment, anything that is remotely suspicious. They are quick to detect infrared heat signatures on anything. Everyone, as I say, was fast asleep, behind a rocky outcrop, aligned with a plethora of sandbags. In the early morning of that day, the stillness of the valley had been deceptively tranquil, and it's easy to be fooled by the whiff of serenity, but ours was soon disturbed by a gruelling barrage of bullets that had taken us unaware. But we moved quickly upon the Taliban, with a measure of success. But we weren't without our own casualties. One of my dear friends had his torso ripped apart from his legs, with one blow. So we had casualties, and many of them. Sometimes I believe the greatest casualties of war were the perpetual fatigue, the tiredness, the emotional fractures, the nervous exhaustion as well as living on a razor-sharp knife edge of your adrenaline is never easy. One minute things are peacefully quiet, the next moment danger is stealthily creeping upon you, rather like a panther hiding in the dark shadows that you need to watch all the time, lest it should get too uncomfortably close. The one thing you never get used to in war is the way people die. You need a stomach of steel to cope with that. Of course, at our military bases, we've prepared for wartime situations. Even how to cope should we become a prisoner of war, how to overcome interrogation from the enemy camp, and so forth. But nothing ever prepares you for the real deal, when you know this isn't a mock military exercise. This is the real thing. It tastes bitter, feels exceedingly different. No amount of preparation at your military base can prepare you for the realities of war. It's like being a goldfish lowered into a shark tank, and you become blazingly aware that everywhere you look, danger is raising its ugly head. So you need to hide, melt into the landscape like butter, adapt to the mountainous terrain like a chameleon. Let's just say you become poignantly aware of your own mortality. You begin to discern there is always a possibility you might not be returning home. So in some ways, while you're out there on the front line, you've never felt more alive. You accept that dying for one's country is always an honour. Let's just say every man has such an incredible pride towards America, the land of the mighty, the great and the free. Most of the men have loved ones at home, and so dying is not on the cards for them. They want to return home to their beloved wives and kids, so they're determined to defeat death at every hurdle. But at the same time, if their blood is spilled on the soil, they knew that their deaths were not in vain. Let's just say for many with the warrior spirit mentality, they almost certainly approach the war like a football game. This is just one you have to win. Losing is never an option, nor does it engage your mindset. Al Sarge always used to say, Fight with valour. Doubt not your ability to triumph in every situation. Believe in victory.
Visualize your return safely home. You become very close to your peers. Humour can become crude, language sometimes unseemly, but no one cares a jot. It's an emotional release of stewing emotions that need to be expressed. Suffice to say, adrenaline is nudging and pestering you all the time, reminding you that it might just spike in any given moment, when you begin to sense danger in the air. It's amazing when you're out in the isolated barren wilderness, with a heart that misses a beat, ears alert to the slightest sound that might grab your attention. You're sensitive to an intuition that becomes so much more pronounced when you know you could be in perilous danger. I had not believed in a third eye before, that can assiduously see around the curve of time. But after my experiences in this war, I knew that within us is an inbuilt sensitive mechanism that warns us when danger is looming ever closer, for many of us have sensed it before it reared up its ugly head to catch us off guard. It was a bitter cold, very cruel night in Afghanistan, and as I was saying before, the men in my platoon were catching up on some much-needed sleep. They were sleeping behind sandbags that made up our firing location. Two of us were on guard duty, keeping alert to any ominous signs or suspicious heat signatures the twilight might fortuitously thrust upon us. For every trained soldier in our platoon, rocketing out of our sleep was a natural reflex deeply ingrained in us, like a well-exercised muscle that was systematically streamlined in its responses, however immediate they may actually be. I could sense a brewing, smouldering tension that clung to the wind to every single blade of grass. It was an airy, bodeful, spooky feeling, as if I could sense something untoward was about to happen. My friend Rupert informed me that he was feeling more on edge as usual. Maybe we should wake the rest of the platoon and the sergeant up. But that would be crazy. Why rouse the sergeant from a precious much-needed sleep based on our uncertain feelings that squeezed our chests tightly, leaving our throats dry and scratchy? There was no reason to be too hasty. That was when we see it, first through our night vision goggles. A large heat signature shaped like the most massive King Kong-sized human being. For some reason, I don't fire, nor does Rupert, who was sometimes also called Rufus. By all accounts, firing at the approaching threatening heat signature is what we should normally do. It's an instinctive reaction for us. Rupert is saying, What the f*** is that? And I'm saying, What in God's name? Rupert and I feel a powerful, daunting revelation. A deep voice in our gut, rather like the voice of God, warning us not to shoot. Something causes us to freeze over, like an ice statue. This has never transpired in my military career, ever. I kid you not, our hands are clasping our rifles, but they've lost their ability to move. We can see this dark silhouette moving towards us, like a huge black cardboard cutout of King Kong. It's so Herculean in size. I know instinctively that it's not human, as no human can possibly tower at eight foot tall, and appear to be built like an army tank. There is something white flapping on this thing's shoulders, rather like a billowing white sail on a boat, but by contrast to this thing, it's quite obscure, almost as if whatever this thing is, it's artfully wearing a white scarf around its neck. I should have been afraid, but I was fixed to the spot by a sense of awe which stole my anxiety, and even my adrenal response, so that my whole presence of mind had been willfully ensnared by a dreamy, illusory state, where I couldn't discern the difference between what was real and what wasn't. For a brief moment, my thoughts are muddled, confused, rather disorientated. In a trice, the ground cover that obscured the moon dissipates, while a piercing trajectory of moonlight cascades over this idiosyncratic being, so that its figure is now fully illuminated by the light. I know at once it's a Bigfoot. What the hell, I'm thinking. I can't believe this. Any moment now I'm going to wake up and tell everybody about my outlandish weird dream I had last night, about the Bigfoot I saw in Afghanistan. Yet I know that I'm very much awake. This is really happening. The creature is now standing yards away from us. We both have enough sense not to shoot at it. He's covered in long flowing dark hair. Its prominent pyramid-shaped head 
folds into its shoulders in a neat sweep. Its face is alarmingly human. He looks more like those pictures of Nathanderthal, or early man, with some primate influences to his appearance, notably the over-length of his arms and the distinctive head shape. But beyond this, he is so human in every single regard, but clearly possesses night vision. His eyes give off a blazing bright yellow eyeshine. It is what is on the back of his shoulders that actually gets my attention. Would you believe it? It's an Afghan girl. She's wearing a white nightdress. She's only about twelve years old, with big black eyes filled with a fearful trepidation. The Bigfoot places her gently on the ground. He points in the direction of the village. Bad man, we hear in our heads. He tried to take her. I leave her with good men. The Bigfoot pats the girl on the shoulders gently, as if to give her an encouraging nudge. He turns around and glides away, while this Afghan girl stares at us both, at first rather uncertain. But I speak to her kindly, and although she doesn't understand a single word of what I'm saying, she is soothed and reassured by the comforting sound of my words, and doesn't need much encouragement to come running into my arms. The girl's tears saturate my army uniform, while I cradle her in my arms, rocking her gently. Her sobs immediately wake up the entire platoon. Everyone is bewildered by the presence of this strange Afghan girl in our firing location. I mean, this does not ever happen. The interpreter informs us that the young girl's father, Abdul Hanan, recently died. So the uncle Abdullah decided to move in and become man of the house, delighting in taking over his brother's household. It would seem he was an intimidating man who was already sleeping in his brother's wife's bed, even though he had a wife and kids of his own. By all accounts, he seemed to feel he had inherited the right of taking charge over his brother's family now that his brother was deceased. He reveled in what he saw were his privileges as the new man of the household. Little Morsel, the Afghan girl, described Abdullah's eyes as becoming deranged, maddened, crazed. He was brutishly hostile towards her. He frenziedly wrestled with his own clothes, flinging them to the floor haphazardly, so that he stood before her totally naked. Little Morsel was slow to react. She was seized by a fearful shock that rendered her frozen to the spot. Her dark, sultry eyes round with terror, her little jaw hanging wide open in bewilderment, as she pondered to herself what her uncle was doing. Whatever it was, she knew it wasn't good. Abdullah was pressing her down on her body, his weight bearing down on her so hard that she could barely breathe. She buckled under his heaving contours of flesh. She was so terrified and couldn't fight back. She thought she was going to die. She used her mouth and bit him as hard as she could on the arm, so that blood gushed and oozed out of the open wound. Abdullah reacted. He pulled away from her in disgust, his arm throbbing in pain. This was the quintessential opportunity for Morsel to hightail it, and her legs did not hesitate. She ran to her favourite spot, the fertile valley where the animals grazed. Abdullah, now fueled by an incandescent rage, thundered after little Morsel. He managed to grab her. The man began to tear away at her nightdress, but he was stopped, dead in his tracks. A huge growl permeated the night air, followed by thunderous heaving footsteps that galloped out of the tenebrous shadows. Then there he was, an obscure, hazy, Herculean-sized dark silhouette that loomed towards them at the speed of light. Abdullah was flung to the ground. He tried to wrestle his opponent, but it was too late. He was no match for this creature, whom with his powerful hand twisted his head off, threw it into the valley like a ball. Morsel said she watched it bounce and roll. She felt so terribly happy. Her uncle could not hurt her any more. A relief flooded over her, like a refreshing, renewing rain shower. Morsel reported that when her dad was alive, Abdullah appeared to be a good man. But apparently his wife had always described him as like a caged tiger. But no one knew what she meant, until now, when the reality of the man's character, buried under the curtain of deceptive deceit, had come rearing to the surface. Little Morsel tells the interpreter that Abdullah had changed once her dad died, 
It was like he wanted to take over their lives and their household, and everyone in her extended family was terrified of him. She told us that as her uncle's head bobbed over the field, a couple of curious cows trotted over to the strange rolling ball to investigate it, crowding around it with a curiosity, followed by a lengthy cacophony of moos. It was rather extraordinary, I was told. The girl realised the Bigfoot had saved her life. She told the interpreter that the creature spoke in a funny way to her. His words entered her head like thoughts, but it was a voice that was clearly audible in her head that was not her own. The Bigfoot told her he'd take her to good men, who would not hurt her. He threw her onto her shoulders and delivered her to our platoon. She told us that playing as kids, they'd often seen this hairy man, who always seemed to watch over them. She was never afraid of him. None of the kids were. But most of the adults said mean things about the Bigfoots, calling the creature dirty names. She didn't dare repeat, as they might actually offend God. The Bigfoots of Afghanistan are known to pilferage crops and animals from farmers, but she knows that the hairy men know good from evil, and like us they need to eat to live, so we shouldn't judge them severely, and as far as this hairy man that saved her life is concerned, she said he was sent from God himself, for she believed after biting Abdullah, he might have raped and killed her. Needless to say, we returned the young girl to her delighted, thrilled mother and the body of Abdullah was found with his head ripped off, in a way that is hard to fathom. Everyone, including Abdullah's wife and children, were so glad he was dead. Abdullah's wife said if she ever saw the hairy man herself again, she would cook him a feast or leave him food in the meadow to compensate for his very great kindness. God works in mysterious ways, she told the men, and he sent the Bigfoot to rescue my daughter. Mr. Ridgway takes a deep breath. You see, in every war situation, you can be touched by stories beyond the war. Miraculous stories that get entangled in your own lives. After Mr. Ridgway told me his story, I was floored. I realised I hadn't been writing anything down. This was not a story that I was expecting to hear. If he was going to tell me a story about the war, I was expecting to hear a story of soldiers, bravery heroism. But this, no, I wasn't expecting to hear this. I was also very impressed by the incredible kindness of the American soldiers that they showed towards the Afghan girl. How did the Bigfoot know these men were so good? Let's just say the American soldiers had killed many a man in these gruesome battles, but this was war. The Bigfoot had an all-knowing insight beyond what we humans could ever understand. He could easily discern a good heart from an evil one, like we might distinguish the good apples and the bad apples in our fruit bowls. Mr. Ridgway, I say, clapping my hands, as tears spill down my cheeks. The story has touched my heart to the quick. Do you know, sir, this is the most incredulous story I've ever heard. It is so out there that I cannot doubt its integrity whatsoever. You cannot make stuff like this up. You just can't. When my teacher said older people had stories to tell, she was certainly not wrong about that. I shake Mr. Ridgway's hand, thank him profusely for his help. Two months later, he's dead. But after I presented my report to my teacher, she called me to one side and said, Did that really happen? Yes, ma'am, I told her. It surely did. Wow, that is one hell of a story. All these years later... I am married with a couple of kids of my own. My autistic brother also lives with our family. I carry this story in my heart like a very precious jewel. If you happen to be visiting a bar in Boston during the day, you see an inebriated woman hanging out of the bar, slurring on her words. It's probably my mother. Nothing has changed in that department at all. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.